be in Matthew chapter number 5. For those of you wondering, we will finish up, Lord willing, Matthew chapter number 5 this morning. Uh, and then we'll move into chapter number 6 next week. Well, last week we looked at how we are to respond to evil. Uh, we're told that we're not to resist the one who is evil. We're told that we are uh, to respond in a calm and peaceful manner. And that we're told uh, that we are to go above and beyond what is expected of us. In other words, we're not to act like the natural man may act. We're supposed to act like Christ would act. And that's how we're, they're going to see Christ in us. And I admitted to you last week that that could be a hard pill to swallow. Because it goes against our natural reflex. It goes against the flesh. When somebody does evil to us, our natural response is to go back and do evil to them. That's just how, that's how the flesh works. And so that's a hard pill to swallow. Um, but if you thought that was a hard pill to swallow, just wait until you see the directions that Jesus gives us this morning. Um, and, and I believe this is the last part of this, and I'll, I'll tell you why in just a few moments. But we are told here in this section that we are to love our enemies. Now, how many of you think that's the first thought that comes to your mind with your enemies is to love them? Anybody? I told you it's another hard pill to swallow because it goes against the natural reaction of the flesh. But that's what the Lord says we have to do. Uh, and so as we close out Matthew chapter number 5, we're going to look at that. Uh, and we begin in verse 43 uh, as we look at the, the, the tradition as we've started with this. He says, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And so that, that's their tradition. That's what's being passed down. That's what they're being taught. Uh, and so uh, the, the declaration there, Jesus is wrapping up. I told you I, I consider this section the but I say section of this teaching uh, because he uh, always says what they're teaching. And then he turns around and says, but this is what I am telling you. All right. Uh, and so the task that he gives us seems to be impossible. But the task that they gave seems very possible. Uh, what they had been teaching, what they had been learning, you have heard that, that it is said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So that's what they're passing down. That's what they're talking about, okay? Uh, and so uh, he's going to go against that. He, and, but we've got to look at the difference in that. This statement is a little different than the previous ones of this section. Up until now, he has uh, stated... They can't hear me. I've come unhooked. Give me just a moment. Technical difficulties. Don't matter if it's on, if it's come unhooked, does it? All right, now we're hooked back up. Probably that Dunlopped over disease. Y'all know what that is, right? Your belly Dunlopped over your belt. Probably unplugged me. But anyway, so that, that is the declaration. That's what they are teaching. They're teaching that you're to love your neighbor, but you're to hate your enemy. And so as we look at that, it's a little different than the, the other things, the other traditions they've been teaching. Uh, as we look at that, he says, uh, up until now, he stated, you shall not, not murder, you shall not commit adultery. Those are the kind of statements that he's made up until now. And those are legitimate commands that had been given by God in the Old Testament. Now, they took and ran with them and added some things to them, but those were things that God said. God said you are not to commit adultery. God said you are not to commit murder. So those were, were firm foundations, all right? Now, this statement, however, introduces a detail that God never told the people of Israel. And so uh, what they're teaching, they had definitely added to it. Now, we know back in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, that God commanded us to love our neighbor, okay? That part is true. But nowhere in the Old Testament scriptures do you see where God commands for us to hate our enemies. And so they're teaching this, and they're, what they're teaching, God didn't even say. Okay, and so that's what makes this one a little different than the other. Yes, God did say the first part, to love your neighbor, but God never said the second part, that we're supposed to hate our enemies. 
okay? So we have to do some deduction there. Why are they teaching this? Why, how did this become part of their tradition in teaching? Uh, and so we got to reason this out, and, and I'm going to give you two possible thoughts as to why they're doing this. Uh, first, they took the word neighbor and ran with it, assuming that they are to show love to their neighbor, literally, their neighbor, okay? Nobody else, just their neighbor. So if they're their neighbors, they're the ones that they're supposed to show love to. And so they took that, just ran with that, focused on neighbor. We can hate anybody else as long as we love our neighbor. And that is what the Bible said, right? Okay? Uh, how many know that sometimes you've got to look a little bit more and see the heart of the message? And that's what Jesus has been doing all through chapter number 5. He's saying what they were saying, but he's saying here's the true heart of it. All right. Now, the second possibility are that these religious leaders might have taught that since the enemies of God are wicked, that means we are required to hate them since God hates evil. Now, does God hate evil? Yes. Okay. Does God hate evil, evil people? No. God loves everybody. Amen? And so that's what they've done. They've taken the deed and they've attached it to the person. And so now they're saying that we're to love the neighbor, but we're to hate evil people or hate our enemies. But that's not what God taught. Whatever reasoning, Jesus is about to shock them with this teaching. Because like I told you, if you thought the other that we looked at last week was a hard pill to swallow, certainly this is a hard pill to swallow. How many have problems loving your neighbor? Some, you know, how many of y'all are lying right now? How many are like, I, yeah, I, I have some problems, but I'm sure not going to tell you about it in the Lord's house today, so I'm just going to sit here and be quiet. All right, let's face it, we have trouble loving our neighbor. So I know good and well we have trouble lo loving our enemies, amen? And But that's the teaching that we see here. Look at the expectation, the teaching in verses 44 and 45. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of your, of our, of your father who is in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain to the just and the unjust. And so we see here in this teaching, the, first of all, the expectation there in chapter number 40, uh, verse 44. Again, he says, but I say... And now if he says it, guess what? That's the final authority. It doesn't matter what you wish it said. It doesn't matter what you think it should have said. If God said it, that settled it. I read somewhere this week, there's one thing that you will never find in the Bible. Your opinion. Because God doesn't need it. Your opinion doesn't count. His word counts. If he says it, that settles it. And we've seen in each of these things, Jesus says, this is what you're teaching, this is what you're practicing, but this is what I say should be doing it. And as I've explained to you each week, since it's his word, he ought to know what he meant when he said it. Amen? And so he said, this is what I say. And Jesus is about to share something with them, a, a radical idea. I'll go ahead and tell you that but not optional. Just because it's radical, just because it goes against what we may think, does not make it optional. And this is not an optional thing. This is something that we have to do. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus once again reminding them that pleasing God means that they must go beyond selfishness, go beyond legalism. Instead of only showing love to the neighbors, we are to show love also to our enemies. This is not just in word, this is in deed. It's easy to say that we love someone. It's a whole different thing to show it, amen? All right, we just had this past week, Valentine's Day. Anybody uh, go into Walmart on Valentine's Day? If you enter into, or really the week leading up to it, if you enter into the store on the grocery side, the whole front end of the store was nothing but boxes after boxes after boxes 
of flowers and more flowers and more flowers and more flowers. And, and I, I, I had to go a couple of times a week. The first time I went, I said, good night, that's a whole bunch of flowers. I'm like, there's no way they're going to sell all those flowers. And then I went in there on Valentine's Day. Guess what? It was almost gone. Of course, this is free for you, okay? Men, this is what you need to do. You and your lovely spouse or your significant other, you need to come up with a deal, okay? Just sit down, talk about it. How many know things are getting expensive these days, okay? So look, hon, all the world can celebrate Valentine's Day on February 14th. Why don't we celebrate ours on the 15th? Amen? You come into agreement, now you got your candy half price, you got your flowers half price. Because that's what it was. All the flowers they had left the very next day, guess what? It was all 50% off. But isn't it funny? There are some ladies, the only time you ever get flowers is on Valentine's Day. Why? Because the world said that's our love. That's our love day, and we have to show that we love them. In other words, that we're supposed to be putting that love into action. I got news for you. Whatever you do on the 14th of February, if it ain't what you do in the rest of the year, it's just a show. That's the same thing here. If we say we love our enemies, but we don't put that love into action, that's just a show. It's got to go beyond the words. It's got to go to the deeds. Love has to be seen in the action. And here specifically, that action, he says, is Pray for them. Pray for them. You know what I have found? It's very difficult to hate somebody you're praying for. Not if you're truly praying for them. And so I believe that he's got what, what he's heading to. Instead of hating your enemies, pray for your enemies. And I guarantee you, if you will sincerely pray for your enemies, you're going to see that hate begin to disappear. In God's eyes, all people are our neighbors, even our enemies. We are to respond to everyone with love. And we need to understand, I tell you this all the time, love is a choice. Now, like, that's an emotion. You may not like people, but you have to love them. So you can choose who you like and don't like, but the Bible says as far as when it comes to loving people, we're to love everyone. In fact, Jesus says by that, everybody's going to know that you're his disciples, that you have love one for another. So yes, like uh, is, a, is something that, you know, hey, that, that person just doesn't sit right with me or whatever. That's a, but love is a choice, and that's a choice that God says that you need to make. We're to respond in love. We must trust that God will protect our cause and deal with our enemies in the way that he sees fit. And when we won't do that, kind of like what I told you last week about doing with the evil, if, if we don't do that, what we're saying is we don't trust God. We don't trust God to work that situation out. This love, what we might find, that this love might very well turn an enemy into a friend. How many have ever had somebody you just didn't like because you thought you weren't supposed to like them? Maybe your friend didn't like them, or you ever noticed that, that whoever's your friends, that nobody else can, if you don't like them, nobody else can like them either? I'm going to tell you, you show love for somebody, that friend, that enemy may soon become your friend. Because usually everything that you've heard about somebody, usually it's not all true. You ever realize that? But we think if we don't like them, nobody ought to like them. But if we love them and we get to know them and we're praying for them, that enemy may just become a friend. I told you at the beginning, it's, gonna be, it's a tough pill to swallow. And I can look at some of your faces and on your face you say, Preacher, I don't care what you say. There's just some people I'm not going to love. Well, lest you forget one small detail, I'm not saying it, I'm repeating it. 
God said it. So if you choose to ignore it, hey, that's not on me, that's on you. You got to deal with God on it. Doesn't matter whether you wanted to hear it or not. The Bible says once we hear it, once we know it from the Word of God, we, you know, we are now responsible for it. And so there's not a one of you who under the sound of my voice can hear my voice. Raise your hand. All right, if the person beside you is not raising their hand, hit them in the ribs. Get their attention. Tell them to look up here. So every single one of you heard that we're supposed to love our, our enemies, correct? Raise your hand. Everybody heard that, right? You are now responsible for that. You can't go out of here pleading ignorance. You know that God said it. Well, there in verse 45, we see the example. Understand when we respond by showing love, we are imitating God who shows love toward his enemies. I love what it says here. It says that God calls his son to shine on the good and the evil. You do realize he's God. He can make the sun shine wherever he wants it to. I think it's amazing. This happened more than once, actually several times. I'll go out to church on the back side of the church, and the sun's out on the back side of the church, and the front side of the church is raining. It's the weirdest thing you've ever seen. We were on a, on a trip somewhere up on 81 through the mountains up in Virginia, and the, the lane coming toward us heading back, uh, I guess that would be heading east, they're coming this way, we're going this way. Their lane is raining on them. And, I mean, their lane's nice and sunshiny. Our lane, we're getting rained on. And, of course, going through the mountains, we'd go in the rain and right back out the rain. And then in the rain is the, is the weirdest thing you've ever seen. So trust me, if God wants it to rain on somebody, he can make it rain on them. If he doesn't want it to rain on them, he can make it not rain. If he wants the sun to shine on them, he can make it shine. If he doesn't want it, then he doesn't. But he reminds us that the sun shines on the good and the evil at the same time and that the, he produces the rain for the just and the unjust at the same time. Why? Because God loves all of us. God loves everyone in the world, both the good and the evil. Let me remind you that you were once enemies with God. Before you got saved, now you might not like this, but that's the truth. Because there's only two sides. You're either on the devil's side or on God's side. And so before you were on God's side, you were his enemy. And listen to what the Bible says in Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So even when we were enemies with God, he sent his son to die for us. Folks, does love paint a better picture than that? He has given us the example of how we're to love. Well, then we get into the truth here. Look at verses 46 to the end of the chapter. For if you love those who, if, excuse me, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only the brothers, only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So he gives them here, and the, the truth here, he gives them some reasoning in verses 46 through 47. He challenges the level of their love for others. And he begins by using an example of a tax collector. He asks, if you love those who love you, what does that show? He says, even the tax collector does that. Now, it's interesting that we come to this during time. How many of you doing your taxes? Filling out your taxes? How many of you right now, your, your uh, government is your enemy? Because <laughs> they're taking all your taxes and giving them to somebody else. But tax collectors were known to have a lack of integrity, morals, and loyalty. They were known for that. Now, I'm, I'm not saying anything about our tax collectors today. You'll have to make that judgment call on your own. But those in that day, that's what they were known for. Poor morals, no loyalty, no, no integrity. Jesus says even they find it easy to love their family and their friends. So these that have uh, no integrity, poor morals, and no loyalty, even they are able to love their family and friends. Why? Because that's natural. 
He then uses the example of the Gentiles. If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing uh, that others do not do? He says even the Gentiles. And understand when he's talking about the Gentiles, when we come to this, Gentiles and Jews, that's it. That's everybody. You fit in one of those categories. All right? That's, that's all there are in the world, Jews and Gentiles. Now, when the Bible's talking about Gentiles, he's talking about the unsaved people. Okay? So he's saying even those that are unsaved, if somebody come in and said, hey, how you doing, shook your hand, they shake their hand. Amen? I mean, you do it. Hopefully you do it at church. If somebody comes in, you don't even know them. If we got a visitor, I hope you shake their hand. I've been told by most people that we're a very friendly church. So you, you don't even know them, but you shake your hand. It says, you know, uh, even, even the Gentiles will shake the hands or, or greet those the people that they know. Why? Again, that's only natural. If somebody comes up and says hello, it's natural for me to do what? Say hello. <laughs> That's the response. But then we get to the requirement of verse 48. Jesus is telling us we need to go beyond the natural. We are to be led by God. This verse sums up the, the but I say declarations. If a man would live the way Jesus has told us to in this chapter, he would be perfect. Now let's kind of review. He would never hate, never slander, never speak evil of another person. He would never lust in his heart or in his mind. He would not covet. He would never make a false oath. He would always be completely truthful. He would let God defend his personal rights and not take it upon himself to defend those rights. He would always love his neighbors and even his enemies. Now, if we could do all of those things, don't you agree that we would be perfect? That's what he's saying here as he closes this out. He wraps them all up in that. If, if we could get all of that together, then we'd be perfect. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have got all that together? I mean, we've been studying it for several weeks now, and, and we still haven't accomplished those. See, So if we were putting all of it in, in action as we were learning it, we only got one more to do today. Now we just got to go love our enemies. We already got everything else accomplished. But let's face it, we don't have everything else accomplished, do we? There's only one man who's ever lived like that, and that's Jesus. And the only way we can ever hope to come even close to being faithful to his instructions and let him, is to let him guide the way. Do you have the kind of love that both loves your neighbor and your enemies. We don't have an excuse. It's commanded of us. Now we're going to find out as we study through the rest of this book, uh, there's strong evidence on just who our neighbors are. And you're going to find out by the time we finish the book of Matthew, guess who our neighbors are? Everybody. Everybody. We're going to see that there's evidence that where we stand with Jesus is very much based on where we stand with our neighbors. I believe the first step of showing love for one another is to, to introduce them to Jesus. We have the greatest gift that we could ever have. We have the greatest thing we could ever offer someone, and that's eternal life with Jesus. Now, how many of you, we just got past Christmas, right? Now, I know some of you ladies, I know it, in your closet, you've got some presents that are wrapped up just in case somebody stops by and brings you something. Tell me I'm wrong. I know how you women work. They come by, and you won't expect them, you won't expect a gift from them, they give you a gift, you oh, well, hold on, I got you something. You go on to the thing, and... Give them a present. How much thought went into that present? Nothing. You just picked it up so you'd have a gift in case somebody stopped by. You didn't really care what it was. You just wanted to give. I think I've shared this before. One time I got a pack of socks, and there was a pair of socks missing out of them. A lot of thought went into that one. I think they went in the bedroom and said, hey, wrap them socks up. But, hey, at least the ones I got were new. They didn't give me the used ones back, so. 
Now, take that person that you love more than anybody else in the world. How much thought goes into that gift? We are to love like Jesus loved. The first thing that we can do is give them that greatest gift, and that is Jesus. But listen to me, I can assure you, they are not going to listen to a word you say unless you can show them something worth pursuing. We've all heard it, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Don't try to give me a Jesus when you've shown nothing but hate and evil toward me. I'm not going to listen to you. Amen? So we need to love them. We need to love our neighbors. And then when we love our neighbors, that opens up the door of opportunity for us to then share Jesus with them. We need to be the kind of people that people will say, you know, that, that's somebody that, that loves you. That's somebody that, that'll do anything for you. I don't mean to embarrass him, but I remember going around town the day after Charlie's house burnt down. I was helping him. We were picking up some things and then, you know, just meeting some people. And then the, the, the week to come and, you know, just talking to people. And they said, they said, man, I just hurt for him. He said, you, you won't find a, a nicer guy. He'd give you the shirt off his back. If it was the only one he had. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the kind of reputation I want to have around town. Amen? Amen. Somebody that's known for loving other people. Why? Because that's the kind of person people are going to listen to. Some of you were here yesterday. I, I shared in, in my message yesterday that, that we let preferences rob us from being who we should be for Christ. When all the world sees is what you're against, you're not going to win anybody that way. you got to show them what you're for. Now, I'm not saying we ought not to stand against some things, but show people what you're for. If everything's negative, 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 most every time you talk, when they look at you, they're not paying attention. It's like the teacher in the Charlie Brown show. I don't understand a word you said. We need to show that love. What does Jesus say? We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. We're going to teach that person that Jesus loves them because we're going to show them the love through Jesus' servant. That's what we need to do. I think it's fitting that he closes out this but I say section with this command to love not only our neighbors, but our enemies. Is it going to be easy? No, it's not. That's why we need him. And so my prayer for you this morning is that we might have some folks down here at this altar. Maybe there's somebody you can think of right now. You thought of, you know, it, it, you would say, well, preacher, I wouldn't consider him an enemy. Well, you consider him something. Do you love him? Maybe you need to come down and say, God, teach me how to love that person. Some of you have been trying to reach people for Christ, and you, you wonder why you can't reach them for Christ. Let me ask you, how much love have you shown them? Maybe you need to come and ask God, God, help me to show the love, your love, in such a way that they would then listen to what I have to say about the gift that you're offering. I doubt there's a person from this pulpit to the back pew in this room that doesn't need some help in this area. Why? Because it's not natural. It's not natural to love those that don't seem to love us. But Jesus set the example, the ultimate example. He loved us so much he went to the cross. Think of all the world out there that is still rejecting him and that will continue to reject him, that will never get saved. He still loved that individual enough to go to the cross. That's the love he's commanding us to have. And if that's not the love that you have in your heart, you need to find your way down to this altar and say, God, help me to have that kind of love.
I'm going to ask Sam to come and play Have Thine Own Way. And while he's playing it, I want you to be praying it. Because that's the only way that we're going to show that kind of love. Is if God has his way in our heart. Father, we love you and praise you. Thank you again for the day. Thank you for your message. And Father, if we're being honest, it is a hard pill to swallow. We don't naturally love those who do not love us. But you've commanded us to love not only our neighbors, but also our enemies. So help us take the steps that we need to take this morning to make that a reality. Help us to choose love. Fill this altar this morning with people that are begging you, Father, to help them to choose love. And Father, for all that, we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name.